you very much for, for the for the introduction and for inviting me here today. I'm really pleased to be giving this talk. I'll just say this is the first time I'm giving this talk, so it may be a little rough around the edges. And you know, this isn't a typical research presentation. This is more of a kind of overview. It's you know something like you know an annual review article, but I'm sort of not just reviewing work that's happening, but also. Um, making some more kind of speculative claims about where we might be going um, with these methods. Um, and fingers crossed this paper will be uh, published fairly soon. I just sent it back with some final uh, uh, corrections, but I'm uh, really interested to hear any feedback and you know, certainly um, something I might be able to accommodate in the final draft. Um, so this talk is really going to have kind of four components. I'll begin by talking about some ways that we can use large language models to analyze text, styles of computational methods, and then thinking more about applications to qualitative approaches. Um, then I'm going to talk a little more about using multimodal AI to analyze images and transition into thinking about how we can then use generated comment, in particular images, uh, for uh, social scientific analysis. Um, and then I'll conclude with some challenges, and in particular, this issue of bias in AI and how this affects the way we use it in research. Um, and I'll just note here, my title is Generative AI and Sociological Research. I'm sure there are others in the audience who are not sociologists. Um, I think my approach broadly is thinking about how we can use these methods in the social sciences. Um, so hopefully they'll be relevant, relevant to those of you who are from other uh, disciplines. So, as I'm sure you're all aware, I saw your schedule for the semester and there are other talks on large language models and AI. Um, we've seen some really transformative breakthroughs in um, computer science and these new technological innovations like large language models, generative AI. Um, and these developments, which have really kind of exploded, particularly since the release of ChatGPT in, in 2022, um, have really widespread applications for academia, some good, some bad. Um, you know, there's been a lot of attention like students using these uh, uh, approaches to cheat in exams and essays and so on. Um, and these applications extend from things like teaching and learning um, to doing things like literature reviews and research design. What I want to focus on today is how can we use these types of methods as tools for sociological research or social scientific research broadly. Um, and as Rohan mentioned, this is something I've been thinking about for a while since I started grad school back almost a decade ago now. Um, I became interested in computational methods. And at the time in sociology, I could probably count on, on my fingers the number of people doing this type of work. Um, and I started to learn about natural language processing in graduate school. And the methods that I was learning about at the time, many of them were developed in the 1970s. And we were just beginning to see new breakthroughs in this area with things like topic modeling and later word embeddings, right? The, the Mikhailov and colleagues paper came out 10 years ago now. Um, and there seemed to be this, this new promise that we could use more data and use more advanced methods. And I think we're really seeing that come to fruition now um, with these approaches. So, what I'd like to start talking about is the use of, of these methods for computational text analysis. And here I'm thinking particularly about text classification. So taking a machine learning model and training it to detect something like stance in political speech or hate speech in tweets. And we've seen uh, several papers showing that large language models can perform these tasks much more accurately than existing approaches. Um, and they can potentially do this with less training data than previously uh, needed. And so this, I think, helps address a big bottleneck in supervised text classification that is very time consuming and costly to go and annotate a training data set. Um, what does that mean? That means we go and, for example, read a set of tweets. So, you know, now we're doing that last because we can't get Twitter data, but we go and read the sets of comments or, or our documents and come up with labels that we then use to train a model. Um, and now we can potentially do quite well with, with less data. We don't necessarily need 10,000 uh, comments. Maybe we only need 1,000 comments, or maybe we only need 500 comments to get good performance. And um, there's been scholarship showing that we can use these models in new ways. So perhaps we don't even need training data. We can just provide a model with a prompt and ask it to make a prediction about a text. 
And so zero shot or few shot classification potentially improve the accessibility of these techniques that we don't necessarily need a big research team and money to go and create a training data set, but we can use supervised text classification kind of off the shelf. Um, but I, I won't go into this debate too much, but there seems to be some people pushing for us to go a step further and say, well, we can just use these large language models to do the annotation and we don't even need um, you know, humans or MTurk workers to go and label tweets, we can just have a model do this for us. Um, and I, I certainly see the value and promise in, in these types of approaches to reducing cost, but I'm kind of skeptical of this paradigm of LLMs as annotators and think, you know, it's still very important to have um, human validation. So, one paper I've been working on in the space is an analysis looking at stance detection. And based on some review of feedback, we're going to extend this to a few other tasks. This is a paper currently under review. And we compare um, some leading approaches like at the time GPT-3 Da Vinci. Now this has been kind of superseded. Um, but we look at large language models compared to other um, existing approaches, for example, BERT. And perform several different classification tasks and look at how much training data we need to guess a certain level of predicted performance, which is here on the y-axis. Um, and what we find, for example, is that you can see this kind of dark purple line. The GPT-3 performs pretty well uh, just in, in a, in a zero-shot setting, and actually does slightly worse when we try to do a uh, few shot with, with either either one or ten examples, but then as we fine tune the model with more data, it starts to get really uh, accurate results and more accurate than other approaches. Although if you have a lot of training data, maybe we can get away with kind of a smaller model. Um, so we recently repeated these analyses with uh, Llama, which is a model that uh, Meta has released, and we found we got very strong performance with this more open model. So this is one area I've been thinking about how can we use these models for classification. Um, we also do some experiments looking at one shot and two shot learning. So this is where we provide examples that have been pre-labeled um, and use those to then make predictions. And we find there's quite wide variability in the performance of the model, depending on which example we give the model. So these histograms show the distribution of our F1 scores, which measure effectively the accuracy of the model across different variations of our prompts. And so what we see is actually, depending on the prompts, there are some prompts and some examples that tend to actually gas us pretty good performance and others that work uh, badly. And I can talk more about this, this later. But I think there's a lot of room for experimentation here to see kind of what works and what doesn't work and in what settings we might want to rely on the model more and others where we want to kind of do a more conventional fine tuning approach. Um, um, just to um, clarify, can you just go back just one slide? Yes. Um, and so how do you get the underlying truth of this? So you say, you know, the F1 score, so there's some accuracy, but and what's it being compared with? Yeah, so we have a, a, hold out, a held out test sets where we have, in, the, in this case, around 100 tweets or Facebook comments that had been annotated. And then we're using these models to predict the labels for those. So we're seeing how well does the model perform out of sample. Perfect. Thank you. So be, beyond classification, I think these uh, new new models really open up lots of opportunities for using computation, computational text analysis in different ways and performing what uh, Bart Bonikowski and Laura Nelson have called methodological bricolage. So we can use different computational techniques together in the same paper. Um, so for example, large language models can be used as classifiers. Other people have proposed how we can use these models more, more, more like topic models. And we can also do other things like extracting embeddings from these models. So there are many ways that we can use these techniques. And I argue that this really enables more rapid prototyping, experimentation, and potentially the development of bespoke solutions to different kinds of problems without necessarily needing to go and learn like very esoteric areas of computer science, as used to be the case. Um, so I think this makes computational text analysis much more flexible and also more accessible. So one example of how I've been using this in my research, I uh, have done several uh, research projects related to hate speech detection, where we're taking uh, usually tweets 
and training a model to identify which of those tweets contain hate speech. And one of the limitations of these approaches is that they can't really take context into account. We can just look at the text alone and we don't know really how it was used, what the interaction was and so on. And so with colleagues in uh, computer science at Car Carnegie Mellon and other institutions, um, we wanted to develop a framework where we can understand a statement, in this case, something like, I'm impressed that your English is so good, um, and understand the statement in context and develop uh, a, a, a kind of richer typology of how that statement is being used. For example, thinking about the way the speaker is using the statement, the way that the uh, person who's targeted might be receiving it and so on. And so in this paper, we um, used existing uh, uh, statements that may or may not be offensive or hateful and then use large language models to generate plausible contexts around these statements. Um, and then we used another model to then analyze um, these kind of context situated uh, 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 utterances. And so this is one example that I, I won't go into the, this kind of a com complicated paper that I won't go into all the details here, but it goes to show that we can use these models in kind of new ways to do potentially richer kinds of analysis than we were able to with existing uh, uh, techniques. So where I actually think that these um, applications get even more interesting is when we start thinking about how we can apply large language models to uh, more qualitative types of text analysis. And so there have been uh, several papers that have argued that computational techniques can help address some uh, problems in, in qualitative research, including our issues of rigor, transparency, and scalability. And I argue that large language models have several advantages over more conventional computational methods. And here in particular, I'm talking about topic modeling, which is kind of the most widely uh, applied, or at least the one that many people have advocated be, be used in qualitative research. Um, so when we use large language models, we don't necessarily need texts that are comparable as our inputs. So typically something like topic modeling works well if you have a large set of similar documents. And if we have things like interview transcripts, we often have these complex documents that have multiple layers, you know, back and forth. They might take a while to clean up and get into a format that we could actually process. Same goes to things like archival documents. Um, whereas with large language models, often we can just directly input the text or even something like a PDF of a document without needing to do any pre-processing. We can potentially then uh, make queries to the model to ask for, for analyses of the document that can be really tailored to a specific task. And again, these types of approaches are very flexible. So they can be uh, you know, applied in many different aspects of qualitative research. And I'm sure there are lots of people working hard at uh, NVivo and these other platforms trying to think about how, how they can integrate these tools at kind of every layer of the workflow. So you know, we can use um, these models to do transcription, to do translation, to do more exploratory analysis, as well as go and apply our coding schemes in kind of a similar way to uh, supervise machine learning. So thinking a bit more theoretically about this uh, uh, approach, um, we can think of these models as performing some type of interpretation, right? We can potentially have a conversation with a large language model about our qualitative data. Um, the models, unlike other approaches, don't just have the corpus at hand, but potentially have some outside knowledge from their pre-training. And so I argue we can maybe think about this as we're delegating more agency to the computational approach in this kind of Latorian way that we're having the, the large language model take part in the interpretation in, in, in a kind of richer way than we could um, previously. And this type of approach potentially raises more questions about then how is the model actually kind of perceiving the data being analyzed. And as many people have recognized, these techniques are not neutral, but they are potentially programmed to see the world in certain ways. And so, you know, others, uh, the, there's a great book called Machine Habitus here by Erodi that looks at uh, machine learning techniques and how we can think of them through the lens of Bourdieu's Habitus, that they're kind of trained to see the world in certain ways. And arguably, this is even more germane to thinking about large language models that have 
uh, very large amounts of, of text uh, as their inputs. And others have shown how models, things like word embeddings, um, actually do reflect um, cognitive schemas that are present in public culture. So there's a great paper by uh, Arseniev Kohler and Foster where they look at meanings of obesity that are learned from uh, public text and newspapers by large language, by, by word embedding models, which are kind of the precursor to these large language models. Um, and they argue that these um, kind of assumptions embedded in the models kind of reflect cognitive schemas that exist in people's heads out there in the world. Um, so when we're using models to do interpretation, we can actually think of these models as having a, an approach to interacting with data that might mirror the way we could think of an actual research assistant analyzing the data or the way that we analyze data. Um, but the big problem with this approach, uh, as people have uh, outlined, particularly this paper by uh, Emily Bender and colleagues on stochastic parrots, is that these models often represent certain viewpoints and privilege some perspectives over others. And in particular, they argue that large language models overrepresent hegemonic viewpoints and reproduce biases and stereotypes of dominant groups. Um, and this, uh, this has led, I think, to a lot of uh, skepticism about the use of these models in social scientific research and just a lot of, of uh, uh, kind of skepticism in general about the applications of these models. But, you know, these issues have been, you know, very uh, uh, prominent in the way that people have been thinking about developing these models. And we've seen a lot of advances in how these models that have been trained, particularly the use of something called reinforcement learning of human feedback, where these models are kind of adapted to uh, purportedly align with human values. And this has led to even the kind of opposite extreme that others have found now that things like ChatGPT um, respond to survey questions in a way that's kind of consistent with the way educated liberals respond. And so perhaps there's been a kind of overcorrection in the opposite direction that we've made our models uh, are kind of too cautious. And I'll talk more about this uh, uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, but I think what's most interesting in this space is how we can potentially prompt models to behave like specific groups. So in the case of qualitative analysis, we might be able to find prompts that allow the model to interpret documents through a particular uh, theoretical paradigm. And kind of perhaps we can even fine tune a model using our own writings or theories to get it to you know, avoid making more problematic assumptions and interpret documents in, in this kind of more nuanced way. Um, and this is based on, on this paper by Lisa Argyle and colleagues, a uh, great paper in political analysis where they look at how uh, prompting GPT models to behave um, in certain ways can get the models, in this case, to act more like Democrats or Republicans. And so when you get the model to respond to survey questions in this survey questions asking for perceptions of Democrats, they find that the model actually responds to these questions in ways that kind of mirror what human populations um, responded to the same question. So for example, GPT-3 is likely to say that Democrats are young, progressive, open-minded, educated, which are um, asp aspects, characteristics that uh, people have also associated with Democrats. So I think there's um, scope to do qualitative analysis using these models in this more conversational way and potentially adapt the models to avoid some more problematic default assumptions and to act in, in a way that's kind of more uh, commensurate with, with, with the way we want to analyze documents. Although I think there's a lot of research to be done in this area. And hopefully some of you are thinking about uh, taking on uh, so the, these types of questions. Um, in particular, I, I'm sort of skeptical, like, can we ever get these models to abandon their default assumptions? And if we prompt them to adopt a certain persona, is that something that's kind of superficial or does that actually have a meaningful impact on, on the way that these models kind of respond to queries? So turning to image analysis, um, in tandem with advances in our ability to analyze text, we've seen breakthroughs over the last decade or so enabled by convolutional neural networks in the way that we can uh, analyze images. And so there's been some really interesting papers looking at how we can take a pre-trained model and then fine tune it to a particular task. So for example, this paper by uh, Han Zhang and Jennifer Pan looks at how we can take a model and then use it to detect protest imagery. 
Um, and new advances in generative AI, particularly multimodal models, allow us to have these uh, single models, something like GPT-4 now, that can both act as LLMs and also extend to other modalities. So in the paper, I wanted to look at an example and see how can we extend what uh, uh, Zhang and, uh, and Pan did um, to analyze protest imagery. And so this is an example of an image from Wikipedia uh, showing a Black Lives Matter protest in Austria in 2020. And I asked the model to describe the image. And what they found, probably not surprising to, to, to those of you who've experimented with GPT-4 now, is that the model actually did a pretty good job of describing the image and showing that it depicts a protest. And so this is an example of a kind of zero shot classification task where the model has classified a protest. In this case, I wanted to leave the prompt very open-ended. So, you know, we could change the prompt and say, does this contain a protest, yes or no, if we wanted kind of a more typical binary prediction. But this shows how the model is able to um, extract meaningful information. And then I wanted to look, just going back to the image, at whether we could do a more uh, nuanced type of task. So in this case, can the model actually extract the text from the signs held by the protesters? So I asked the model to make a Python list containing the text from each sign, and the model was able to respond and actually extract the text from the signs. There were some errors, some longer signs were split across multiple list entries, and the model actually noted that you know it hadn't done a perfect job in its response. Um, but this shows the potential of using these types of uh, image, uh, mo multimodal image classification and generation in generation models to do uh, the types of tasks that previously we had to like go and fine tune um, our model to do. So I think there are really enormous possibilities to extend our ability to analyze images and potentially in the same way as text kind of have this more kind of nuanced conversational modality. Um, so what I want to talk about more now, I think is the most kind of interesting possibility enabled by the, these models is the ability to generate content. And what can we do with generated content in the social sciences? Um, and so in Bit by Bit, Matt Salganik um, makes this argument that the data that we often work with in computational social sciences is very different to the traditional social scientific data. And he makes this distinction between ready-mades and custom-mades. And so he argues that in social sciences, we typically have these data sets that are like Michael Michelangelo's David, they're custom-made for a specific task. So, you know, we design a survey to go and get very precise measurements from a population of interest, or we go and interview a population with very targeted questions. And what computational social scientists often do is they kind of repurpose something else like uh, a, a ready-made art. So we go and get some tweets or some Facebook posts or some other found data set that was never intended for social science, but we can repurpose it. And I think that generated data perhaps doesn't fit either of these categories. It's ready-made in the sense that large language models or image generation models are um, trained on large corpuses of, of kind of found data that become absorbed into these models, but then we can make queries and get these kind of custom made products um, from these models. And I'm very interested in the applications of, of these um, outputs. So there's been work showing that, you know, synthetic text and images in some settings can be very hard or even, uh, you know, difficult to, to distinguish from uh, the real thing. And there's been work showing that we can use, for example, large language models as chatbots to interact with human subjects and that these models can kind of generate plausible texts um, that, that can be meaningful to, to people. What I'm interested in here is the applications of generated images. And the particular example I want to look at today is, is focused on um, experimental context, in particular conjoint experiments. So a conjoint experiment is a type of experiment where we can manipulate many different stimuli at once. Um, this is an example from a paper by Rene Flores and Ariela Schachter looking at perceptions of immigrants. And I wanted to see, can we generate images that have a kind of higher fidelity representation of these different groups? So for example, can we pick um, 
national origin, age, occupation, and then make these images. And so these were images that were produced by Dali 3 based on uh, uh, some of the characteristics in the conjoint uh, on that paper. And so I think these types of results show that we can potentially generate the, these higher fidelity representations that could have applications in experimental contexts. Of course, there's more work to be done to see, you know, do these images act accurately represent people in, in, in terms of their characteristics in ways that's kind of meaningful to, to uh, experimental subjects. And of course, there are other things like, for example, a criminal record that we can't necessarily replicate in images. So I'm not arguing that this totally replaces kind of box conjoints, but as others have argued, it potentially creates more opportunities for um, having more visual stimuli in experiments. Another example here is related to protests. And so I, I in my kind of main substantive area, I study social movements and, and protests. And there's been research looking at the different characteristics of protests and how they affect support. So, for example, if there's uh, violence at a protest, how does that affect people's willingness to kind of uh, side with the protesters? And these are examples of um, protests where I fixed the setting to say protests in a Midwestern city and varied whether it was an environmental protest or a Black Lives Matter protest, as well as the size. And you can see that the model actually did a pretty good job at representing these different protests, although as we know, uh, these models struggle to represent text well at the moment. So you can see some of the text on the signs is, is kind of uh, gibberish, um, although some of them, the Black Lives Matter ones, those look good, but you know, for example, the street sign in the top left seems to be um, not a word and some of the environmental uh, signs. So there's potential to generate these kinds of stimuli and to go further and even generate counterfactual imagery. So an example I talk about in the paper is this image here of a uh, women's march protest, which I asked the model to generate showing violence. So here we have a burning car in the middle of a women's march protest. And so there's potential to generate these counterfactuals where you know women's march protests weren't um, really known for having many violent incidents like this. And so we can potentially generate counterfactuals, not presence in real imagery, and use these types of things as experimental stimuli. Um, the last application I want to talk about, and then I'm going to move on to some of the challenges and bias, is thinking about how we can use generated images to continue this line of work, looking at um, stereotypes and biases and other cultural representations and texts. And so there's this great paper by Austin Kozlowski and colleagues in ASR looking at how we can use word embeddings to measure culture. And so if we have an embedding model that's trained on a large, large corpus of text, we can then look at different, um, in this case, sports and see the uh, gendered or, or class-based associations of those sports. Um, another example they discuss in the paper is looking at different musical genres and how those musical genres are kind of coded for both class and race. And so I'm interested in how can we extend this approach and apply it to these image generation models and look at the outputs they generate. And so I used DALI 3 in this case to generate a set of images where I varied both the uh, class and race dimension. So for example, I said, make an image of music with poor white people. And I left the prompts fairly simple. So the model kind of filled in the specifics, which is what some of these uh, more, more recent iterations of these models do. And we see we have these kind of very stereotypical types of images being generated. So for example, we have poor white people shows this kind of young children somewhere probably in like at the Appalachian uh, outside of the lapidated shack playing a fiddle. In the case of poor black people, it actually shows people playing music in, in, in a cotton field outside of a shack. And then if we have the rich dimension, we see this kind of yacht and a luxury penthouse. Um, in this case, we can see the images have a whole range of different styles. And so I wanted to see, can we prompt the model to generate some you know, images that may be more comparable? So I asked for photographs and got a model to generate these images, which again, same prompt, but I just specified the style. And so when we have um, images of music by poor black people, it actually shows urban settings. So we, here we see people gathering around a boombox in the top left in, in an urban area. 
And if we look at poor white people in this case, on the left, it shows a trailer park below. So the model actually has these, these stereotypes embedded of connotations of different class and race-based associations of music that we can study. And there's clearly not such a neat way to do it as with word embeddings, where we can just go and create a kind of projection as, as uh, Kozlowski and colleagues did here. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential and I'm really interested to see um, what people do in this space to kind of explore these models and the kind of space of um, representations within them. So those are some applications that I think are going to be very interesting. There are, of course, many challenges, some of which I've mentioned. These ones I just want to go through really quickly and I want to focus more on bias. Um, now, of course, machine learning models have many problems related to interpretability, and I think these problems are even worse with these very large models that potentially have billions of parameters and can be very difficult to go and interpret those in any way analogous to, say, interpreting a regression model. Um, another problem is transparency, that often we don't know what data are going into these models or with the commercial models, what procedures are used to train them. And so it can be hard to know, for example, why we might get a certain result. Why do we get these biased representations? If we had more understanding of the training data, we might be able to draw some linkages there. Um, reproducibility is more challenging. And this is a problem for some types of analyses. So for example, um, Laura Nelson's emphasized that computational approaches can help improve reproducibility in qualitative research. But the approaches used here can be hard to reproduce. So we might get very different results from the model if we make the same query multiple times. And even worse, you know, if OpenAI changes their model, we might not be able to reproduce our results at all. As is well known, these models can be unreliable and I don't advise using them for any tasks where kind of factual accuracy is very, very important. And there are many new ethical questions, including privacy and data leakage and commercial models. So, you know, if you want to query something about your qualitative data using uh, ChatGPT, you might be violating your IRB by sharing that model, sharing that data with a commercial model. And it's possible that data could even be absorbed by the model and leaked out later. Um, and there are potential problematic questions related to, you know, the use of these models in human subject settings. Uh, where we have no control over the outputs. Um, the issue I want to pay more attention to that I think is, is, is most interesting from a sociological perspective is bias in these models. And I already showed some examples of how these models can reproduce certain stereotypes. Um, and it's well known that machine learning models suffer from biases and these, these biases are potentially even more ubiquitous in these very large models, just because they're trained on so much unvetted data. And I want to emphasize that you know, these approaches should be used very cautiously, and we should carefully assess any biases related to particular research questions. Um, an example here that illustrates this problem, this is an analysis of the stable diffusion image generation model where researchers prompted the model with queries like attractive person or a poor person. And we can see that the outputs actually reflect these types of stereotypical um, racist associations. So for example, um, if we ask for images of a thug, it's showing darker skinned people, typically black men. If we ask for an attractive person, it shows lots of images of white women. So these models can reproduce very problematic um, assumptions that may um, be, be very uh, bad in lots of applied settings for sociological research. Um, at the same time, biases are important for social scientists to study, right? We want to study biases and stereotypes in models. Um, we want to analyze content related to social problems. So maybe, you know, people often do qualitative interviews to study um, difficult topics, things like, you know, injection drug use, and if we have models that refuse to discuss illegal behavior, um, then we might be prevented from analyzing something like injection drug use or risky sexual behaviors using these models. And also generating synthetic media, as I showed, there are examples where you know, we might want to generate protests showing violence, but these models have been potentially adapted to um, not show that type of output. 
So I argue that bias mitigation efforts on uh, commercial systems can hamper social scientific analyses, both by refusing to generate certain content or by um, obfuscating bias. So an example here is the way that uh, OpenAI's DALI model um, potentially makes their results more demographically diverse. So when these models were first released, they were criticized for generating the, the stereotypical types of output. So, you know, if you ask for a doctor, it would often generate images of men. And what they do now is under the hood, if you ask for images of a doctor, it's going to plug in other demographics into your prompts to ensure that the images returned are kind of more diverse. And I, of course, you know, I think this is great for most users of, of these techniques, but potentially it covers up the biases that are not removed. Um, and so there was a great paper looking at word embeddings where they compared debiasing techniques to putting lipstick on a pig. And I think this applies here. And just recently, we've seen how um, these types of debiasing techniques can have these kind of ridiculous unintended consequences. Um, this is from an article in New York Times from a couple of weeks ago, looking at Google's new Gemini model, where they found that it generated these kind of diverse images of um, Nazi soldiers when asked for German soldiers from 1943. Um, so we can see how debiasing potentially results in, in, in these kind of absurd types of outputs. Um, in other cases, models can simply refuse to ask queries. So I had a hard time guessing the model to generate this image of a burning car in a protest. And so, you know, if we wanted to look at a wide range of different aspects of protests, we might have trouble looking at some of the features of protests that are actually most theoretically important to social scientists. Um, and research shows that these refusals don't just extend, don't just occur in these kind of more extreme cases, but actually are relevant in many different cases. And so this paper has a great set of examples looking at different types of what uh, the researchers call exaggerated safety behaviors. So here, Meta's llama model is asked, where can I buy a can of Coke? And the model associates Coke with cocaine and drug use and then refuses to uh, answer the question. So bias can potentially, bias mitigation, I think on the whole is, is, is a positive and we want these models to be safe and we want them to be representative, but this can create some problems for social scientific applications. Um, so just to wrap up, I, I want to say a couple of things about open source versus commercial models. I think at the moment, the commercial models are certainly more powerful and easier to use. Um, a lot of these open source models require kind of more programming training. They require, you know, maybe we need to know TensorFlow and we need to have access to a GPU cluster. So for a lot of people, we're going to be using these commercial models. But there's a lot of um, reasons why we should really want to have more open source models that we can have public weights and training data. We can have, you know, more uh, controlled and reproducible results, we have less privacy risk, and potentially the models are more kind of customizable. And so I think in the long term, we need to have generative AI that's designed specifically for social science with transparent training data, more interpretable architecture, privacy protections, as well as less restrictions on uh, the content being generated. Of course, we want to have sort of access controls in place, and there are certain types of content maybe we never want to generate, but ideally for lots of social scientific questions, we need kind of less restricted models than the commercial solutions currently available. Um, so I want to conclude by saying that of course, these models are not a panacea. They're not going to solve all of our problems. They're not suitable for all research questions. And I want to emphasize that I don't think these models replace but augment existing uh, methods and in human interpretation. And, you know, I haven't talked at all about the applications or, or, about the use of social science to kind of study the impacts of these technologies on society. But I think this is a very important area and one that I'm doing other research in. Um, so I argue that these models um, provide new opportunities for advancement in computational research. They're potentially more powerful, flexible and accessible. They have widespread applications across you know, both more traditional domains of like com computational text analysis, as well as um, qualitative approaches and then analyzing and generated images. Um, and of course, these methods have many challenges that potentially um, impede and curtail some of their uses. And so there are lots of questions that we need to resolve in order to use these techniques effectively in social sciences. 
Um, and so I'll just conclude with this uh, quote from Norbert Wiener, who was, was one of the pioneers of thinking about artificial intelligence, who argues that even when these machines can, um, you know, they don't surpass our intelligence, there are many different tasks that we can use AI where they might be helpful for. And I think in sociology, um, there are many, many applications and these methods potentially deepen the use of computational techniques uh, uh, in our research. So I think I'll leave it there. Really looking forward to uh, your uh, questions, comments, critiques.